Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be a Friday Reads Actually, it's not Friday, it'll be a weekend reads kind of video. Earlier today I read Italo Calvino's Into the War, which is a series of essentially three pieces of short autobiographical writing. This was translated by Martin McLaughlin and has a very distinctly English translation to it that I'm not sure 100% works. I think there are a couple of points in this in which there are issues that are clearly related to the translation and not to the writing itself that I thought made this feel somewhat less compelling than it should be. This is essentially Calvino's experience during the Second World War. He was 16 in 1940 and Italy at the time had regulations that meant that teenagers were in essentially paramilitary type organizations and then later he was with the communist partisans closer to the end of the war. So all of that is should be interesting stuff but I didn't find this to be particularly compelling and as I said I think some of that was an issue of translation. Also I think some of that is because his war experiences were not necessarily the most interesting one which isn't a problem when you're listening to somebody's parents or grandparents tell you their war stories but because this is a famous author telling his war stories you expect or at least I expected something a little either more artistic or something with a little more flair to it and this just doesn't have that. Now again I don't necessarily trust the translation of this. I think some of the choices struck me as being odd. I don't really know how I feel about this because I very strongly felt the hand of the translator in this. It's hard to judge because I feel very certain that that would read very differently in Italian. And I would be curious to know if you have read that in Italian or if you've read it translated into another romance language, if you've read it in Spanish or French or something. I'd like to hear how, how those translations read. Um, and maybe I'll see if my library has a French translation of this instead. Yesterday I read another short memoir and that is Scholastique Mukasonga's Cockroaches. This is her memoir of the Rwandan genocide that was kind of a precursor to the one in the 90s that I think is what most of us think of when we hear Rwandan genocide. This story, the one that happened in the early 70s, this is primarily about things that happened from the late 50s through the early 70s, at which point she went to university in Burundi and married a French national and moved overseas. And so it's very much about those earlier conditions. And I think this is, in addition to being compelling, because it was compelling, this is an interesting read because I think so much of Rwandan history is presented as here are some things that happened in the 19th century and then here's what happened in the 90s. And I think it misses a huge amount of context to not know about what was happening in the 60s and 70s because it is such a clear lead-in to what then happened in the 90s. Now she does talk about what happened to the majority of her family who remained in Rwanda during the 1990s genocide. Of her siblings only she and her brother who also lived out of the country, she had a brother who was living in Senegal, but all of their other siblings were murdered. All but one of their siblings-in-law were murdered. Most, uh, most of her siblings had you know multiple children and in most cases it's both her, like her brother and his wife and all nine of their children were murdered. She had one brother-in-law. He I think had seven children and one of them survived. She had another niece who survived but was raped and the rape left her both pregnant and HIV positive. I mean it's it's horrific. There are essentially 37 members of her immediate family, her parents, siblings and their children and grandchildren. But I think in some ways that's the story you expect when you hear that someone's telling you, going to be giving you a memoir about Rwanda and genocide and the fact that three quarters of this is about things that were happening in the 60s and 70s I think makes this, I don't want to say a more important read because I think if you have never read anything about Rwanda at all I think it's important to read about the 1990s genocide as well but if you are mostly familiar with the 19th century and then the 1990s this provides a lot of additional context that I think was very important in addition to the fact that it flows very nicely. The storytelling in this is very nicely done for a memoir to the point that when I was looking on Goodreads a, there were a significant number of people who thought this was a novel, which it's not. And I think those people were then disappointed at the end when it becomes kind of a litany of the dead because she goes, when she later returns in the more or less current time to go back to Rwanda to see where their village used to be she goes through lists of not only her own family but of their neighbors and 
teachers and just people in the area who were also murdered just to try to remember everyone's names and to give them that memory. And I think for people who thought this was a novel, they wondered what was happening at that point. And if you look at the two star reviews of this on Goodreads, that seems to be why those people rated this lowly, because they didn't understand that this is not a novel and that that wasn't a strange literary device. This is her giving these people, you know, their memorial. Very compelling. I read this essentially in one sitting. And I mean, to be fair, it is not a particularly long piece, but yeah, definitely worth picking up. I do have a novel of hers out of the library right now, and I just bought a collection of essays by her, so I'm looking forward to getting to both of those now. And prior to that, I read a short little collection of four essays by Audre Lorde called The Master's Tools Will Never Dismantle the Master's House, which is the name of one of the essays in here. These were all written in the late 70s and early 80s. I thought these were... <laughs> Um, I'm not a big note taker, but I do have all kinds of pages dog-eared in here to go back to because this was really interesting because I think there are a lot of cultural discussions about both pop culture and academic culture and humans and interaction in general in terms of race relations in the United States in particular that I think these days are framed as though this is the first time they've ever been addressed and this is clearly those same issues being raised and being addressed or not 40 years ago. And I think even if this weren't compelling stuff on its own, which it is, I think that would be worthwhile just because, and I think this is worthwhile even aside from the writing, which as I said is compelling, um, just to point out that these things like her going to a writing symposium that is supposedly about quote-unquote diversity issues and her wondering why is she the token black lesbian woman? Uh, where are the other women? Where are the other... why is everyone else white? Why is everyone else heterosexual? Which again, too many people think is something new. That's the focus of two of the four essays in here. Another two are more, I would say, more focused on literary issues, but not exactly because there are social forces in that. One is about eroticism and kind of a high culture, low culture discussion. And another one is about poetry and the both mechanics and meaning of poetry, which I thought was really interesting. So I'm going to say for a tiny little book, this had a lot of ideas and a lot of things to think about. I'm going to say I do think these are overpriced in Canada. These are designed to be sold for one pound and they're usually six dollars in Canada. I got this for less because I had a coupon, but I think they're overpriced even given that they're not produced over here just because I know uh, Folio has a series of similar sized books that are priced at 150 euro and they're sold for like three dollars Canadian which is half of what these are sold for and I think that's kind of overdoing it. But that's maybe an aside from the book itself. Changing styles of writing. So prior to that I did read some fiction. I read The Book of M by Pang Shepard. This has made the rounds on among a lot of the science fiction and fantasy readers on booktube. This is a post-apocalyptic urban fantasy that's set essentially in a near current day in basically a split of the Washington DC metro area and then later in New Orleans that focuses on a few different people and where they're going in this kind of zombie-esque world in which people lose their shadows and then lose their memory. One of the things that some that I do see a lot of reviewers mention is that the system of magic in here is a little ridiculous and you have to be able to buy into it to enjoy this. And the people who enjoyed this enjoyed this a lot in general from what I've seen. And I have to confess, I don't buy into the magic system in this. Not so much because of the shadow memories connection, although I do think that's ridiculous, but when you go with it, it's like, okay, I want to know what's happening because this is compellingly written. Despite the fact that I thought it was ridiculous, I did still want to know what happened with these people. But as it goes on, the magic becomes so much more ridiculous and so over the top in a way that didn't make sense. And I'm going to give a small spoiler here, so if you don't want to have this spoiled, you can jump ahead. There's a point in here where a person forgets that a market exists and so it and the people in it disappear. However, as these people who've lost their shadows lose their memories, they forget everything. So why hasn't everything disappeared? There's no internal logic to that, and as a result, I thought everything was ridiculous. Additionally, I was really irritated by the fact that there was one point early on where people say they're going to go scouting 
in downtown Arlington, meaning Arlington, Virginia. I used to live in Arlington, Virginia, in Roslyn, and there isn't really a downtown. Like, I think they probably mean they were going to Clarendon because that's essentially what would be a downtown, but because it's part of the DC Metro, it's not really like that. The fact that they said downtown Arlington was just weird to me. It was also weird to me that once one of the main characters goes into DC, they're like, oh, you came all the way from Arlington? Like, the Potomac is not wide. Even in a weird apocalypse situation where maybe it's five times the length, he's talking about the bridges and where they are and they seem to be in the appropriate places. If you've ever played Fallout 3, the video game from, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, it's set in the DC Metro and there are parts where you cross the Potomac and which is also in a zombie apocalypse kind of wasteland. And I just thought those two bits were weird to me. Either way, I still found this really compelling, but I just, there was just no consistency to the magic system. And I thought that was ridiculous. I also thought it was ridiculous that in a post-apocalyptic world where you presumably are aware that there isn't going to be electricity, there isn't going to be air conditioning, that people were all drawn to go to New Orleans. Even if you say that the magic is somehow involved in that, I just don't buy that you would head to a city like that, that people would be flocking to New Orleans in an apocalypse. I just didn't believe most of the things that were happening, not even the magic, I just didn't believe the world. However, many people are able to suspend their disbelief in regards to those things more than I am and enjoyed that a lot more than I did. Although, to be fair, I did find it very compelling and I enjoyed it in the sense that I enjoyed reading about these characters on their journey and I like kind of the idea of watching one of these main characters as they lose their memories. I thought that was all really interesting but just the all of the fantasy elements and some of the regional elements just didn't work for me so. And finally one of the books that I read during the reading rush that wasn't part of one of the series that I'm going to talk about separately. I read volume 5 of the New 52 Batwoman. I had read the first four and then the sixth version of this a few years ago. Um, for whatever reason I never got around to reading volume five. This is, I would say, serviceable but not particularly good, especially this ends there is an artist shift and then a story shift at the very end, which ties into the sixth volume of this, which I thought was genuinely terrible. So it goes into that, which was a vampire story, and I thought that was ridiculous and I also didn't like the art style. So I, I would say that this volume is where that run of Batwoman started uh, tanking, basically. I do like the art in the first part. The whole thing is written by Marc Andreco, and so I don't know why it has that tonal difference when it moves into the vampire story, but it does, writing-wise. The artists do change, so there are a number of artists working on this. I'll note everybody down below. But yeah, it's average. If you've read any of these, I'd love to hear what you thought of them. And I'd also be curious if you've read things where you definitely felt the hand of the translator, like with that Italo Calvino memoir that I read. I'd love to know what you thought of that, and if you went and tried to read it in a different language, or, or if you've read multiple translations of the same book. I'd like to hear... I'd love to hear about your experience of that. Anyway, that's it for now. Ciao.